All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma session. Both or all together we have our meditators here in Hamilton doing their best to struggle through the difficulty of intensive meditation practice very much to be commended and we have the group of attendees in Second Life who are brave in another way, struggling through the trials of getting virtual reality up and running, and taking the time every day, some of you, to come here and to listen to the Dhamma. Uh, then we have we have the audio, the live audio, if anyone's listening. The audio is easy because you can listen on your phone or it's quite low tech, relatively low tech. You just need the URL and you can listen into the live stream or you can listen to the MP3 later on. And finally, YouTube, of course, which is the easiest of all. Many people just find these videos, I think, through a search or through a related video or people following my YouTube channel. So we have a large audience, which is always nice. Thank you all for tuning in and for watching these videos. Tonight, tonight I wanted to talk to you all about right and wrong. this question of what is right and what is wrong. And it's a big question in our meditation. It's really what we claim to be able to figure out through the practice. The first question we have to ask is not, not what is right and what is wrong, but is there right and wrong? What does it mean to say something is right and something is wrong? A lot of people will, will have you believe that there is no right and wrong. Or more commonly will say that it's relative. There is no absolute right and wrong. So there, there are two ways we can understand. That there, is, that there exist right and wrong. I mean, from a, from a purely materialistic or sign, um, physicalist point of view, sure, there's no right and wrong. But that really points more to the problem with the physicalist outlook on life or, or more, as we more commonly understand, an impersonal... Um, A, um, you call it a, a, a sort of a non-first person or third person impersonal point of view. And the real problem is that it's an abstraction and that's what you find curious about. There's this curious thing about um, the, idea, the concept of, of there being no right or wrong. So the idea goes that atoms, of course, have no right or wrong state, and rocks don't know right or wrong. And going by that, building the human beings up from these uh, entities, atoms and cell molecules and cells, it's hard to say that there could ever be any right or wrong, right? looking at it from that point of view and a superficial 
understanding of Buddhism might have you seeing things in the same way. If you look at the Abhidhamma, you just see a bunch of mind states, body states. It seems very much, very similar to the physicalist outlook. It's just giving a description. And yet the Buddha was quite clear that there is right and wrong. He was quite often, um, or he's portrayed as, in the texts as describing what is right and what is wrong quite often. So the first thing, the first way we can understand right and wrong is, I think, very much in, still in line with this physicalist point of view or the, the third person impersonal concept of there being nothing intrinsically right and wrong. There still is right and wrong, and we shouldn't gloss over this or, or miss this. Uh, and that's the right and wrong of, of claims, right? So if you say God created the the universe, well, it may not be investigatable, but it certainly is either true or false, or true and false, or neither true nor false, but much more rarely those last two. Most claims are usually either true or false. Some sometimes they're more complicated and you can't actually a claim can't actually be discerned. But there are some pretty simple claims that are pretty uh, easily uh, categorized claims as being either right or wrong. But in a, another way of looking, this is true or false, right? But if a claim is true, then it's it's also right, and 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 that's an important distinction. For example, if you say that craving is the cause of suffering, or 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 more and more. Practically, uh, desire will lead me to suffer. Desire leads one to suffer. I mean, that, that's that's right, according to Buddhism. Now, some people might say that's wrong. But these are important because they they define how we look at the world. They clarify our our position or our understanding of how the world works. This important part of the meditation practice, as I was talking about yesterday. What is reality? Reality is body and mind. Well, that's a claim. Some people would claim that reality is made up of atoms and subatomic particles, and those are made up of who knows what. So we would say that our claim is right, and the claim that reality is made up of atoms or subatomic particles is wrong, we would say. Of course, then it gets, it's complicated. We wouldn't be so quite so cut and dried. We would say, really depends how you look at it. But um, regardless, that it, it, there's something more right about saying that reality is made up of experience because experience is something that can be known. Now you might say, well, well, maybe there exist things that we can't know. And so the argument is that the very fact that we can't, cannot possibly, never ever will be able to know these things, it's, it's, it's by definition impossible to know these things, renders them less real, and therefore less right as a means of, under, of, of understanding reality. So you see where I'm going with this? We're not yet talking about the quality of things, we're talking about claims or the way we understand reality. There is, or we could argue that there is a right and a wrong way to understand reality. Because if you, uh, you know, to put a point on it, if, if you understand reality in a certain way, um, the results are, are, are more or less likely to be in accordance with that understanding. So if your understanding is that Craving will lead you to, to, to happiness. You know, clinging to things, desiring things, will lead you to happiness. Well, when after some time it, it leads you only to suffering, you, know, you have to say, well, that was wrong. I was wrong to think that. Regardless of whether you say it's right or wrong to suffer, you were wrong because your claim turned out to be false. Your understanding, your outlook, is a very important part of Buddhism. 
you know, for example, looking at the three characteristics, when we, we talk about impermanent suffering and non-self, what we mean is that we have a wrong understanding of reality as being stable, satisfying, and controllable, and belonging to us, you know, proper to be uh, clung to, or, or, or having some intrinsic nature of, of selfness. And so as we meditate, we start to see this isn't true. We start to see that our mind is chaotic, that the body is chaotic, that nothing is ever predictable, that, that things are not stable or predictable or, or um, constant. And realizing that the way we look at the world and the way we expect things to be predictable and stable is causing us suffering. We start to see that uh, we were wrong. It causes us suffering because it's, 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 we were simply wrong about what we thought about, about reality. We thought it was like this and it's not like that. Well, that causes stress and suffering. You know, not yet saying whether stress and suffering is wrong, though we probably want to say that eventually. We're just saying we were wrong when we thought that it was permanent and it wasn't permanent. We thought it was stable, it was unstable. And we think things are satisfying and they turn out to be unsatisfying. We think we can find happiness by clinging to things. This will make me happy. If I get this, if I cling to it, if I build up this, then I'll be happy. You're wrong. And finally, self. We, we have the, we, we try to control things, we possess things. We identify with things, this is me, this is mine. And so we have the idea that we can that things are controllable, things are me, they're mine. We start to realize, well, it's not really reasonable to suggest that these are me or mine. And we suffer as a result, but we suffer. And we suffer because they go against our understanding. When our understanding is that we can control things and then they aren't under our control, we realize we were wrong. We were wrong, they're not under our control. We thought they belonged to us, we realized, well, you could conceive of them as being yours, that's not wrong. Yes, I conceive of it as being so. <laughs> but you could still say it's wrong because there's not really much reason. At the best you might say it's unreasonable to suggest that these things are me or mine. Because they come and they go of their own Accord, causes and conditions having nothing to do with me or mine in any way. So we have to conclude, I think, that it's wrong to say these are me and mine. It's a very important part of Buddhism. You see, because modern times it's all about things being relative. If it's right for me or it's right for you, and just because you think it's wrong, doesn't mean it's wrong for me, which is so problematic. As you can see, hopefully, from what I've been saying, these, my claim is that there are very clearly things that are wrong for everybody. They're wrong because they're wrong. Wrong understanding, wrong, uh, wrong, wrong logical assumption, of a logical conclusion. I think in general we'd have to agree that there is wrong. And then there is right. You know, it's right to say that everything that arises will cease, that nothing, in, nothing that arises is permanent or stable or satisfying or controllable and belonging to us. But then we get into the interesting, more interesting and more difficult, I think, this is the more contentious, question of whether something, some action or some thought, some mind state, we're going to stick mostly to mind states, I suppose, with Buddhism, can be right or wrong. Is it wrong to kill? Is it wrong to steal? Is anger wrong? Is greed wrong? These are different questions. This is a different question from whether saying that our understanding of the world is right or wrong. Though they have to do with that. You know, we kill and steal with the understanding that it's going to bring us happiness. It doesn't. It's 
going to eliminate suffering. It doesn't. But there's the, there's the question, is it right or wrong to suffer? And I think the, the real problem here is that we've, we've cornered ourselves or we've shot ourselves in the foot, I suppose you could say, with our scientific, our, our impersonal conception of reality. It's curious, really, because logically you want to think, well, yes, a rock doesn't know right or wrong, and so if reality is based on all this, then you know, there is no right and wrong. But that's what's curious, is that, re that right and wrong, in this sense, only have anything to do with experiential reality. And the concept that there is no right or wrong has only to do with conceptual reality. And it's, imp it's important to see this distinction, to see that experience very much has right or wrong, because experience is very much, I would say intrinsically, intrinsically tied to happiness or suffering. Intrinsically tied to getting what you want, not getting what you want. It's intrinsically tied to uh, right or wrong. There's an intrinsic right or wrong in experience. See the, so the reason why we have a, why it's difficult for us to come to this conclusion that there is right or wrong, is because we think of reality as impermanent. That's the most the, the most egregious form of of saying there is no right or wrong. Is I think it's egregious in the sense that it it mixes up reality and, and abstraction because any concept we might have of rocks and, and uh, atoms is conceptual, is abstract, it's not based, it's not really experience. Our experience is uh, it's very much caught up with, with good and bad and right and wrong. Another way that, that it's denied that there is any right and wrong is to say right for me, right for you. And that's fine, I think that's important because uh, because there are many things that are not right or wrong. Like we can say um, lighting incense or candles in this way or that way, this way is right. Right, so there are many, if you look at religions, most people look at religions in terms of the outward expressions of lighting candles and incense and bowing down and praying and and thinking about God generally. And, you know, we could even argue that Buddhism has a God. Buddhism has a God in the sense of karma. You know, it has a God in the sense of samsara. Samsara is sort of our God. And bear with me, I mean, I know Buddhism is, is atheistic, we don't, of course, pray, we in fact think, get me away from this thing, but, but that's God, you know. It's God because it's the, um, it's the system, it's the all, it's the, the entirety. And, and so my point being here is that all religions relate somehow to this, this concept. And, and people look at this and want to say, oh well, then the differences are merely cosmetic and to each their own. This is right for me and this is right for you. And that's, that's, understand, that's fine. You know, lighting candles this way, lighting candles that way, speaking this way, speaking that way. It's all superficial. It, it, there's no right or wrong involved there. But we go further than that in Buddhism, and this is the idea of, of praying to God in the first place, or, or revering God in the first place. Buddhism will acknowledge, we could acknowledge, based on some fairly broad, vague conception of what God is, we could say, okay, yes, there's God. Yes, you have the universe, and you have laws, and um, you have, I mean, laws of nature in that sense. You have order, an orderly sense 
of reality, and it, it is real, it does exist. But it's not right to worship it in any way. You know, we worship God in so many ways. There are the theists who worship the concept of God, and then there are the materialists, and by here I mean like the consumerists who worship pleasure. We worship the body as being the be-all, end-all of happiness. We worship sights and sounds and smells. We worship money. We worship power. And this is all wrong. It's wrong to do so. That's what we would say in Buddhism. We would argue for a sense of wrong here. It's wrong to do so. So the Buddhist sense of wrong and of course everyone, yes, different people have their ideas of what is right and wrong in this context. But in Buddhism we, would, we have our own specific ideas of what is right and wrong. But the, the ideas are based on that which brings you suffering is wrong and that which brings happiness is right. And so the argument here is not uh, not merely the idea that, that certain things do bring you happiness or suffering, but that intrinsically, reality, experiential reality intrinsically has something to say on this topic. That intrinsically there is something wrong about suffering. It's the very definition of wrong. And you might disagree with this. This is something that I suppose is controversial. But I don't think it should be controversial. I think we have this concept of, of suffering, or this category of experience, this category of reality is that which is suffering. And that I think that is wrong, intrinsically. I don't think there is any argument, there should be any argument here. I was talking to my friend about this, and she was the one who told me, who got me onto this and said, there is no right and wrong. And she was talking about letting her son suffer. Her son was suffering, and she let him, and she didn't console him. And so it's important to understand what we mean here. We're not just talking about um, simple suffering, like pain, for example. We're talking about this this that which betters a person, that which leads a person to greater happiness, that which leads a person to greater suffering, that which is pure of mind, in the sense of having intentions to bring happiness, having intentions to bring peace. We would argue that these are right. No matter whether it's through tough love, sometimes you have to let people suffer in order to learn, in order to grow, in order to be free from suffering. But there's nothing intellectual about this. This is what we start to see in meditation. And this is how we can know that this is right, that there really is a right and wrong. Because as you meditate, you naturally, you, you can't avoid the truth. You can't avoid the truth that suffering is wrong, and whatever causes suffering is wrong. It's not intellectual. You just can't, you can't possibly convince yourself. The only way you could convince yourself is by doing what we do and, and running away from the truth or chasing our tails to avoid the reality of the situation. As you meditate and you start to see reality, you can't avoid it, and you can't force yourself find yourself unable to force yourself to suffer, to cause suffering. Start to realize that there is something wrong with me. There's a lot of things wrong with me, and, and they're truly wrong. And the great thing, of course, is that we can change them. The power, you know, the great power that we have is that we can right these wrongs, intrinsic wrongs. 
they're intrinsic, intrinsically wrong, but they're not intrinsic to us. We can change. I think another reason why people shy away from the idea of there being right and wrong is because they don't have this concept that we can change. If you were to say something is wrong, we'd have to say a person is wrong. You know, you're wrong. There's something wrong with you. Of course, no one wants to hear that. And even to suggest that that's a good thing to tell people, right? If I tell you there's something wrong with you, you might get very angry at me, or at least feel very sad and feel bad about yourself. My teacher told me there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with all of us. There's lots of things wrong with us. But it's empowering to know that. Because if there's something wrong with the engine, well, you want to know about it. It's empowering because you don't want to drive the car without fixing it. So what we're doing is we're making mechanics out of us all, to use this analogy again. And we're going to fix what's wrong. And this is why the Buddha taught the Eightfold Noble Path. We call it the Noble Path, but it could easily be called, that's what it's called, that's the name the Buddha gave it, gave it, but another name for it could be called the Right Path, because that's the word the Buddha uses, Samma. Right? We have right view. Right view is important. It's important to not have wrong view. Michad, Titi, wrong view. Wrong view because it causes suffering. It's wrong. It's not good for you. It's not right. Um, wrong thought, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood. They're all wrong, wrong, wrong. Wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, wrong concentration. And so we cultivate what is right. We don't have to ask. You don't have to ask me what is right. The point here, the point with all of this, is not to be able to even discern intellectually what is right and what is wrong. Not to be able to decide. It's to look and to see. And through looking and seeing, you will start to develop right view, right thought. You know, that which is good for you, that which is uh, in line with reality, and that which leads to peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering, that's what's meant by right and wrong. So there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best. Hope you all find the right path.